night. Uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, go over what I was listening to with uh, once again trying to uh, maybe unfetter or pluck out some of the threads that that seem to captivate uh, uh, people in in the hot air balloon of, of Anton um, with uh, regards to his um, supposed premises um, um, when when he approaches language when he speaks of uh, philosophy from the the vantage point and from, from which he claims it uh, from which he uh, guides the listener um, to particular considerations and I wanted to discuss um, his uh, consistent insistence on suggesting that one cannot escape uh, anthropocentrism and the idea that uh, we are embedded uh, somehow necessarily in culture that, that these descriptions are, are a little bit problematic uh, in that um, he uh, he seems to wander on anthropocentrism and, and uh, assume that there's no escape from it. And in considering uh, what it might mean to escape anthropocentrism uh, is found through rerouting a distinction between uh, anthropocentrism and logocentrism. Um, the uh, language speaking uh, ability, uh, the digitizing of of form in language um, and the maneuverability of of the logos and uh, saying that one is uh, uh, confounded uh, bounded by uh, language if they're to speak at all they're speaking using language and this somehow shows uh, a difference between uh, speaking being bound in language as a human faculty relative to suggesting that what one uh, projects from self is necessarily a reflection of self uh, in terms of uh, anthropocentric uh, dialogues. So there seems as if there's always this this roundabout, uh, this circumference where he's suggesting that there is no escape from the eyeballs of a human because you are human. But I'm saying that in the process of saying that, uh, he's actually speaking about the confines of logocentrism. And uh, anthropocentrism, kind of to unfetter that a little bit, might also be to speak of our genetic differences, um, to speak about how actually different uh, we humans are with our capacity of logos, but how genetically uh, different than uh, that we are from each other and how uh, what might even be argued as a phenomenological uh, differences um, could be could be uh, re we, we, we realize that some of these phenomenological differences um, uh, the, the descriptions the descriptions of uh, uh, basically to say our phenomena uh, it seems that Anton um, is what once again uh, he he wants to bind the we right? Recent video he was speaking about the victimhood or the we who is the we audience of us of uh, Stepbot's video, and I criticized the we who is the we we are speaking of when when uh, we are speaking about the differences between the uh, empirical uh, description you know uh, of the Piraha tribe uh, kind of the lack of God lack of history. Uh, very empirical in terms of their interaction with their reality and the, this seems to be present in uh, what's absence in their logos and uh, his response was uh, about the schismogenesis almost a, uh, we're only to look at it after we already import our uh, vision of language upon them but more importantly what, what I uh, want to note is that uh, when when Anton speaks about phenomena, he's he's utilizing once again a canonized history um, that he keeps rooting back to authors. Right, he has not escaped. There there was once there was once a um, uh, uh, a phrase that said uh, education is what you have um, 
<laughs> how did it go? Like education is what you have when you're when you're um, when you you uh, are done being schooled, something like that. It's almost as if uh, to maintain attention to books to be caught up with in a professorship is to never vacate the castle, the ivory tower, right? It's to never um, find one's uh, abandoned from language. It's it's an adherence. It's a marriage. It's a binding to. And this seems to be one of my my critical um, uh, uh, critiques of Anton is that uh, what we what we seem to have uh, quite often is um, a description of reality that is not consistent uh, with that, that is either consistent with scientific method or with you know, empirical descriptions. And I, I want to suggest that there's another uh, form of living as um, a human, being within the category of human, but being genetically distinct from other humans, uh, significantly different, in so much that there would be an exception or an opposite to that which is uh, either uh, of the scientific method or that which is uh, described as uh, empirical. And since uh, Anton seems to embrace these uh, these two categories and suggests that he's simply idea dropping in there, does not um, overlook the fact that he's still within these confines. So what, what I'm noticing is that um, his distinction between, uh, you know, that we are uh, uh, twisted off from the universe, both separate and bound to the universe, these kind of distinctions that a feeling is a feeling of something, that a sense is a sense of something, that an intention, that you have attention of an intention to, um, the prethetic and the thetic, the uh, curse, the cursor and the uh, and with the placement of the logos and and what the content of the logos is, I'm using an example of proofreading here. But but if you lay down a mirror relative to proofreading, well, let me not go there. Let me start. Let me back up. Um, well, uh, basically, he's he's within the confines of of. Um, and this is why I say he hasn't made a, a nice distinction between logocentrism and anthropocentrism is because uh, everything that he's discussing appears to be justified in um, uh, partici participle distinctions. And these participle distinctions uh, are, it, it's just a matter of grammar. Um, the mere fact that we can make uh, a distinction between uh, uh, did and doing um, and between uh, look and looking, right? That this notion that one must be attending, that this, he, he speaks of the attendio and the intendium. And uh, this, is, this is a grammatical switch simply along the participle line of language. And once again, this shows uh, a bonding with the logos down the participle uh, strain, making participle differences. And so if, if one wanted to oppose or lay down a mirror against that and say, well, what would it mean to absence oneself from the participle relationship um, and, and not speak of the difference between... Uh, did doing to do and and done um, to to uh, uh, absent oneself. Once again, the the difference. The, the reason I bring this up is because um, I'm suggesting that uh, to find similarity of behavior, an empirical description that describes humans' behavior similar to other animals is very important in terms of escaping anthropocentrism. Um, and I say escaping it because I want to suggest that that one's, you know, that a self-reflection, uh, noticing one's common behavior with animals um, separates oneself from, it separates oneself off from the... Uh, the the lingual boundedness that suggests that what it is I am as human 
necessarily throws me in proximity in in some sort of statistical or empirical, but I'll say a lingual proximity to other humans, where this line, this demarcation line, this requirement of saying we are here and animals are there, this is a demarcation line, once again, laid down lingually, where it doesn't suggest that the genetic difference that I have um, from everybody else does not have similarities to animals. Um, and that perhaps uh, some of the aspects of my being are, are uh, so different from uh, humans, but that because I can play with the logos and I can't escape the logos, then the difference is, is not really expressed heavily. Now, my example of this is um, putting forth the idea that I do not have an internal monologue, that there's no internal monologue that goes on in my head that's a pre uh, cursor to the speech that I'm speaking. Um, and I used to have an internal monologue, um, so I realized that other humans uh, maintain that ideal. But this distinction, if other people maintain an internal monologue in their conscious state or what they want to demarcate as their conscious state, as they're fully clear coming out of, coming out of sleep, if one wants to suggest that uh, that is the case, um, oh, Oh, sorry, someone popped up on Skype there. Um, yeah, what, what, what I'm saying is, um, <laughs> what am I saying? Oh, the, yeah, because uh, other people have always, uh, I'm assuming, had an internal monologue uh, in their conscious state where I have an absence of an internal monologue in my conscious state, and yet we both share uh, the logos, uh, the language, that I could suggest that the difference between me and these other people is is substantial that my absence of an internal monologue might be more akin to a consciousness of uh, of an animal that also does not have uh, the logos so this notion of the pre-reflective uh, consciousness found within a, a logos monologue within oneself that reflects inward and outward to its environment is um, it might, might be confusing to other people because other people suggest that it must be the case. This is where we get the idea of the we, because one's phenomenal take on the world suggests that other people must be within these particular bounds, these particular boundaries. This uh, this tends to confuse other people. This this allows Anton to continue trying to gravitate, laying down demarcation lines, and suggesting that we're embedded to the authorship, that we're somehow coming out of a cloud towards a hidden author that prescribed the the language or the logos that we use because we are logos beings, that we are anthropocentric beings. It's, this doesn't seem to overlook the idea, like the sliding movement or meaning behind uh, onomatopoeic words, sound words, where animals can respond to sounds. Uh, some animals can respond to them as symbols, but uh, every thing within the vibration of my voice, you could say, is responding to uh, the sound of my voice. To them, it might be an onomatopoeic uh, uh, interaction, uh, and yet one wants to say that because one speaks the Logos, that even the term onomatopoeic is found within the Logocentrism. But it, it seems to be the borderline between the Anthropocentrism and the Logocentrism that isn't fetter, unfettered. Um, how how to go about uh, continuing this? Yeah, so there, there's this consistency in embeddedness to suggest one is embedded as opposed to steeped. If one thinks of embeddedness, it's almost as if they're a digital uh, part of a Tetris game fitting within a, a slot to fulfill some sort of sensical wall, a wall with no holes, a wall that is uh, geometric and sound as opposed to steeped, uh, that which is falling into, um, that is uh, caught up within, but not centered, not placed, not necessarily sensical within. Uh, kind of like the difference between understanding something and digesting something. Uh, it uh, appears that uh, Anton wants to, first of all, maintain the lines of what it is we are to follow in terms of phenomenological description, hence putting us within the canon of 
particular authors and then suggesting that these authors are the source, where this overlooks the idea of pre-lingual uh, communal uh, 